Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar with Fullscript MediUrban Professor Carrie Bone. My name is Michaela, and I am part of the marketing team here at Fullscript, and we're very excited to have Professor Carrie Bone here with us today to help us understand the clinical features and drivers of acne, including available drug therapies and diet. Before we get into the presentation, I just wanted to give a reminder that this recording and slide deck will be sent to everybody who's registered. So if you have to leave early or just wanna go back and rewatch it again after this presentation, you'll have direct access to it from your inbox. The recording will also live on the Fullscript website at www.fullscript.com slash webinars, where you can also access all of our past and upcoming webinars. Throughout this presentation, if you have any questions, please just add them to the chat section or the question section on your GoToWebinar dashboard and we will get to them during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So again, I'd like to thank Professor Carrie Bone, who is recognized internationally as a preeminent herbal practitioner, scientist, and academic with a reputation cemented by his significant contribution to excellence in education, research, and advocacy. His passionate commitment to product development, research, writing, education, and clinical practice positions him as a pioneer in the international herbal industry. He is the founder of Medi Herb, author of seven books, contributed to over 100 articles on herbal therapy to peer-reviewed journals around the world, and has remained dedicated to his practice for over 35 years. And with that being said, I'm now going to pass it over to Professor Carrie Bone to take it away, and I'll rejoin you closer to the end for a presentation for a live Q&A session. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Acne can be both physically and psychologically painful and debilitating. Patients are often desperate for a quick fix, but in reality, it's a lifestyle disorder probably superimposed on a genetic vulnerability. Traditional herbal treatments for acne have evolved during the 19th and 20th centuries and mostly are focused on plants that are, are, are described as alterative or the more modern term depurative. But what are they? What do they do? And in fact, are they enough? Currently, with our increasing biomedical understanding of this condition, additional herbs can be proposed for its management via functional herbal therapy targets and uh, weaving into that uh, recently identified biomedical targets. But are you able to identify these and which ones are truly relevant and current? Achieving clarity among this new information and, and to a degree confusion, um, to do that we must consider what typically triggers and drives acne, including the diet. This becomes particularly powerful when we adopt a functional herbal therapy approach, combine, uh, uh, combining it with newly discovered properties of the medicines we use. Especially how our herbs seem to work in harmony with the cell's basic metabolism rather than interfering with it. What I will be covering today should give you a multifactorial framework for the care of your patients. Moreover, this new information gives us a unique advantage as natural therapists through our capacity to instantly translate state-of-the-art biomedical research findings into, into today's clinical practice. So let's begin. So our topics, we're going to begin with a brief discussion of the clinical features pathophysiology drivers and uh, drug therapy of acne, although I think I edited the drug therapy out because of uh, time considerations. We're going to look at uh, uh, the role of diet in acne. Then we'll move to herbs and firstly look at the clinical evidence for herbs in acne, including topical application and, and its sparse and then discuss the traditional herbs from 19th, 20th century texts for acne. Then I will elaborate therapeutic targets and herbal protocols that are informed by functional herbal therapy. Now, it's a new approach to herbal prescribing that I'm advocating, and uh, there is a presentation on this that I have done for Fullscript. 
and then I will revisit all that information and give you a, a treatment summary of a few slides that you can refer to. So let's now look at the clinical features, pathophysiology and drivers of acne. It's the most common skin disease. It affects most teenagers and around half men and women aged between 20 and 30. It's characterized by in, inflamed lesions, usually on the face, back, uh, neck and chest. And in more severe cases, cysts and scarrings can occur. Now, it's important to note that acne is not a trivial disease. Um, it's not a cosmetic condition as per this quote. It's an inflammatory skin condition with a complex pathogenesis associated with a real significant physical and psychological burden. Our knowledge of the pathogenesis of acne has deepened over the past decade. However, as noted in the quote, we still cling to the four major pathogenic factors, which are follicular, hyperkeratinization, excess sebum, inflammation, and the role of a bacterium. It's now called cutie bacterium acnes. It was formerly known as propioni bacterium acnes. I'll be referring it to it as C acnes. However, there is uh, an, an increasing focus on newly discovered biomedical issues, especially at the molecular level. And, and what's recognized now is that the interplay of those four factors is intricate and nuanced and subtle. So just briefly again, describing the lesions, you have the blackheads, you have the whiteheads, in more severe cases, the papules and the pustules. So what are the basic issues in acne? Uh, well, firstly, it can be secondary to endocrine disorders. So you can have uh, secondary acne in a sense, as well as primary acne. And these include PCOS, Cushing syndrome, uh, androgen secreting tumors, and hyperinsulinemia. As noted, it affects the sebaceous follow follicles and they're sebaceous glands that are associated with hair follicles. And it's linked to excess hormone production in people who have the primary form of acne and these hormones basically encompass androgens, growth hormone and, and related like insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, insulin and glucocorticoids. So, all of these hormones, if they're in balance, can individually or in various combinations play a role in the development of acne. If we uh, look at the pathophysiology, um, what seems to be the primary event that triggers it is uh, hyperseborrhea. As noted earlier, it's, it's uh, confined to the areas where, where you do have um, these androgen sensitive uh, sebaceous follicles. And you particularly see that in premenstrual acne and teenage acne. So in the sebaceous follicles, you get too much sebum being produced. Now, possibly as a result or in conjunction, you get an abnormal keratinization of the pilosebaceous duct and that allows uh, C. acnes to proliferate inside. It's an anaerobic bacterium, so it needs to close over so it's not exposed to oxygen. And then uh, what appears to happen is that immune inflammatory response against C. acnes is in initiated, but it's thought that it's more subtle than that, as I'll outline that the cutaneous microbiome, your resident microbes on the skin, also are not in, in, in balance, they're imbalanced, and that can contribute to the inflammatory drivers. So there you see the, the, the four key issues, uh, and it probably goes in that direction. Um, uh, so probably the propioni, uh, well, this is all older 
diagram, so it's now sea acne. So the sea acne's colonisation probably happens in conjunction with both the follicular hyperkeratinisation and the excess sebum production. And finally, of course, you get the immune system involved in release of inflammatory factors because it is an inflammatory condition. So let's now look further at the role of C. acnes. As mentioned, the sebum and keratin accumulation allows it and other anaerobic microorganisms to proliferate and then kind of in a vicious cycle, this organism then stimulates further uh, sebaceous production of fat and stimulates also the activity of the keratinocytes. Uh, as well, of course, as mentioned, it stimulates inflammatory cytokines and the innate immune response, but it is complex. When you look at the colonization of C. acnes on the skin of people with acne compared to control people, there's no quantitative difference. In other words, the amount of bacteria there are the same of this organism. But you do see a higher incidence of biofilms and you possibly have different phylotypes of C. acne that occur in acne that are more likely to stimulate an immune response. It also plays a, another role. I, I mentioned about uh, your skin microbiome. It also plays another important role in the homeostasis of the skin's microbiome. So it, it, it may well disturb in some people the microbiome and that could be a factor on the skin. So let's now briefly look at the cutaneous microbiome. We put all sorts of things on our faces now and, and uh, cosmetics, soap, um, and that can affect it, as of course, can your diet? And I'll be describing uh, factors in diet that are linked to acne, and many of these could be acting by disturbing the cutaneous microbiome. And then it's affected by internal factors, genetic, you can't necessarily do anything other than compensate for, but certainly hormonal balances you can address. And as already touched on, modifications to your natural skin microbiome when it goes into dysbiosis can make the inflammatory responses in your, in, in your skin uh, more sensitive and more likely to happen. So essentially there's a dysbiosis of the skin probably going on to acne. Now, I, I really like this, this uh, 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 quote because it gives us some ideas of what we have to, can do, what we can target, but also what uh, a future thinking about the management of acne uh, might be like. So this quote says, rebalancing the natural microbiome of the skin by restoring the natural skin barrier, so there's one target, limiting the proliferation of C. acnes on the skin by using topical antibacterials that don't cause resistance, and I have a comment there from a natural source later on, and regulating the quantity and quality of sebum will be the main acne treatment challenges in the future. And as mentioned, because because using the functional herbal therapy approach, we can actually translate what is known, combining it with what we know about the herbs and their great versatility of action, we can actually translate what is known now, before they have drugs to do it, into real, real and, and biomedically relevant therapy the very next day. So we've mentioned about hormones and androgens do play a key role in acne. And <clears throat> the enzyme 5-alpha reductase is found in skin, hair follicles and sebaceous glands. And of course that reduces uh, uh, testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the active form on the skin. It's the preferred ligand for androgen receptor transactivation. So acne can be viewed as a skin manifestation of excess testosterone, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, and a higher androgen receptor density also appears to play a role. 
Now, one thing we can do to, to target that androgen response is to increase sex hormone binding globulin because it basically reduces the activity of uh, testosterone and hence will reduce DHT as a result and that can reduce these androgen effects in acne. We can also look at inhibitors of 5-alpha reductase and, and I'll briefly have some comments there. So that's the pathophysiology and it gives us a role of uh, targets but I will be further uh, elaborating on targets as we move along. So one of the critical issues with acne is does diet play a role? So as you heard, I've been in practice for nearly four decades and for virtually every year of those four decades, I've had patients with acne who are being told by their medical practitioners that diet plays no role, that diet has been discounted. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth if you look at the latest research and you see illustrated there are dairy products and they appear to play a critical role. So let's look now at some of the more recent research findings about the role of diet in acne. The first thing we can observe and the studies have happened is that acne is virtually in absent in populations that are still consuming what we can describe as a paleolithic type diet, for example, people in Africa and so on. Um, androgens and hormonal mediators, including IGF-1, are found in dairy products and they can survive processing. And these factors likely contribute to excess sebum production in acne, dairy, the factors in dairy products. Also, uh, sugar, glycemic index, glycemic load, appears to play a significant role. So uh, when, when uh, male patients followed a low glycemic load diet, a, a improvement was noted in their uh, acne. And when a low GI and GL diet was followed, it decreased IGF-1, uh, circulating IGF-1 in our adults, uh, who had moderate and severe acne, and that was just a short-term two-week trial. So as touched on, uh, diet appears to play a role in stimulating hyperseveria, and it's particularly linked to your average Western diet. High glycemic low carbohydrates, high saturated fats, and dairy products. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the sebocytes use the same regulatory mechanisms for uh, fat production and inflammation. So if you, if you stimulate the sebocytes' uh, fat production activity, you're also going to stimulate their propensity to drive inflammation. Now, interesting, the, the hormone leptin is involved because it regulates sebocyte lipogenesis and hence it's also activity to drive inflammation. And it particularly does so by upregulation of this. Now, it has various names for the M, uh, metabolic target of rapamycin complex one, or, or uh, here you see mammalian target, but we know it as mTOR C1. So mTOR C1 signaling via via leptin and other factors is upregulated in acne, thereby increasing sebum production. So we know about mTOR C1, it's involved, it's linked to higher body mass index, obesity, type two diabetes, insulin resistance, and also acne. So we can make mTOR C1 as a target. Now, there are drugs like rapamycin that target mTOR C1, but they, they have problems with their association. When I review what you can do via medicinal plants for mTOR C1, there's nothing that stands out as being active as a direct factor, but we can indirectly target mTOR C1, as I'll show you. So it's not surprising 
given this uh, link with mTORC1, that acne has been described as the metabolic syndrome of the pilosebaceous follicle. And again, uh, this, this review highlighted that no acne is found in people still uh, having diets that constrain hyperglycemic carbohydrates, milk and, and products from milk, other dairy products. Um, and, and it also notes in the review that uh, the high prevalence of adolescent acne is, cannot be explained therefore by genetic factors, but instead by the influence of the Western diet that overstimulates mTORC1, which is the nutrient, nutrient and growth factor sensitive kinase is how they describe it. So uh, a complex diagram, but this basically explains the ways the Western diet um, stimulates acne. So you see that the factors we've identified, high GIGL, refined carbohydrates, milk and dairy products, and saturated fats. And you can see there's, there's two uh, parallel factors going on. One is a down regulation of forkhead box class 01, FOX01, and an up regulation of mTORC1. In this case, they call it the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex. So upregulated and downregulated. So uh, as a result of downregulating FOX01, uh, you get up upregulation of, of the androgen receptor, PPAR gamma, and other factors. And um, that's the downregulation of FOX01, upregulates those, and that uh, enhances sebum triglyceride synthesis, as does upregulation of mTOR C1. You also get increased production of monosaturated uh, fatty acids, particularly oleic acid, and that seems to be a role. And one can wonder, well, does that mean olive oil is a problem in acne? Possibly in excess. I'm not too sure how robust any data on that is, but certainly it's produced and it plays a role. Because uh, when you get uh, triglyceride lipase acting on fats with uh, oleic acid, you get free oleic acid, and that has impacts on uh, uh, car carotenoid uh, um, um, function and, and also increased uh, inflammatory responses by that way. And over, over the, here, <coughs> Uh, it's the it's the C acnes that provides the uh, especially as a biofilm the uh, triglyceride lipase that cleaves um, uh, uh, palmitic acid C sixteen zero and again the C sixteen zero drives inflammatory responses. So the uh, link between dairy acne uh, dairy and acne is strong. Here you see a meta-analysis, and if we look at the pooling of the data using uh, two different statistical techniques, you see there's quite a significant uh, uh, odds ratio of the link between dairy intake and acne. That's about 1.3 odds ratio, so it's 30% higher risk uh, with a higher dairy versus lower dairy intake. Um, also, as you see, a strong link between the glycemic index of the diet, and in this case, not acne incidence, but acne uh, uh, severity. So, um, higher the glycemic index, the more likely the acne is to be severe. And this was uh, uh, from a, a conference uh, report. Uh, and it's and, and it was a dermatological conference, and you see um, the modern face of dermatology is saying that diet is a significant factor in acne. And they also this news news uh, summary 
described acne and the expososome. Well, that word is probably not correct. It's exposome, but that, that's the term they use. So either terminology seems to be used, which is the total amount of exposure you get via diet, environment, et cetera, et cetera, and organisms. Um, but exposome is norm normally the term used. So what did they find? They found that various foods were identified as acne triggers in various studies. So it was a review of studies, refined grains and sweets, candy, dairy products, fast food. Chocolate is an interesting one, possibly because of the fat, including uh, dark chocolate and cocoa powder, although it's debated about that, and whey protein. Of course, it's a dairy, it's a dairy product. And um, this is from a mainstream dermatology journal. So it's becoming very recognized, the role of diet among dermatologists. So again, identifying dairy and high GI, GL diets. Uh, uh, it a kind of dispenses with the chocolate issue as per the, uh, in contrast with the previous study. So as a still debate over the role of chocolate uh, uh, because the thinking might be it's the sugar in the milk not so much the cocoa, that wasn't the case with what they were noting on the previous slide, so it's a bit of uncertainty there. Um, and what they're saying, it should be noted that changes in acne due to any pharmaceutical treatment or dietary changes is likely to take at least 10 to 12 weeks, uh, and herbs will be the same. And acne patients should be encouraged to discontinue any whey protein supplements that they might be taking. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Now, the gut microbiome is, it's early stages, but the gut microbiome is, is being considered as a, a factor in, in acne. So it's important to have uh, a fibre, rich diet and, and because it's fiber is a prebiotic and also it's important to ha have a, a diet rich in polyphenolics and and of course this is where cocoa <laughs> comes into it and cacao so that should be good tech, uh, from that that reason with acne because polyphenols are also prebiotics so you've got the fiber as a prebiotic and you've got the polyphenols as a prebiotic and um, these plant-based foods uh, could perhaps affect both the microbiome through the prebiotic effects, um, but they could also have more direct pharmacological uh, effects um, uh, as well. Uh, but this describes the microbiome uh, effect. And, and it's particularly what they're talking about is that bacterial dysbiosis causes increased intestinal permeability leading to inflammatory mediators such as uh, LPS endotoxins in the circulation. So it's fascinating and I, I don't touch on it too much uh, when we get to the therapy side, but it's fascinating to note that one of the body's natural uh, defenses against LPS as, as, as well as having good gut wall integrity is, is bile. So we do have herbs and globe artichoke is my favorite. For example, uh, I, I do talk about wax lyrical about globe artichoke on my Facebook page. Um, we do have herbs that can ensure a healthy bile production. So that's another angle. And and also traditionally, and when you talk to natural therapists, a lot of them focus on the liver in acne. So it could actually be the, the role of, of uh, bile in lowering the absorption of these uh, factors that, like LPS that uh, drive inflammation. So in summary, an evidence-based diet for acne is low in sugar, and that includes natural sources like dried fruits and, and, and fruit juices, which are particularly rich. So whole fruit is fine, but not necessarily uh, enhanced sources of fruit sugar. Low in saturated fats, low in GI and GL, 
dairy free and that's probably all animal dairy sources so sheep goats and cows and um, if possible lower in branch chain amino acids and general animal protein so i haven't discussed this fully but there's a body of evidence that suggests that branch chain amino acids actually up upregulate uh, growth factors like igf1 and of course rich in fiber as per the discussion on the previous slide and, and of course rich in polyphenols. So let's now quickly uh, move through the clinical evidence for ingested herbs in acne and, and as mentioned it's, it's quite sparse. We have uh, a study on de a decaffeinated green tea extract in uh, 64 post-adolescent women uh, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, massive dose used, 1,500 milligrams of extract. I don't know how many cups of green tea that would be a day, but possibly 10, 15, something like that. And uh, it did re reduce lesions, but the effects were modest. But it does suggest some advantage in polyphenols as per the previous discussion. So we have this very old study done in 1968 with, uh, of chase tree, uh, Vitex agnus castus. It was a German study, a uh, controlled study, but open label, uh, looked at uh, 161 uh, people, men and women, over uh, two years um, uh, using a, a, a doses of acne uh, tincture for a minimum of three months in conjunction with a mild topical treatment. And what they saw was an improvement in 70% of patients, which was significantly more effective than the control group that just used standard therapy at the time, so it's 1968. Um, and it's thought possibly to be due to a mild anti-androgenic effect. Now we know the, the traditional name of, uh, another traditional name of chase tree is monk's pepper. And that's possibly because uh, monks used it uh, as a pepper, that they had it in their diets for its anti-androgenic effects that would therefore reduce sex drive. Um, so there is this mild anti-androgenic effect and I would tend to use much higher doses than that for this and, and I do use chase tree in acne. Then surprisingly, and this is fairly recent, this, this kind of study comes from Iran and we're seeing if you like an explosion of herbal clinical trials out of Iran. Uh, some of them giving quite novel insights. Uh, can be an issue that you're thinking uh, how well conducted are these trials because many of them seem remarkably positive. However, if we look at say for example uh, saffron in and, and the various trials there. Many of them are now being validated in well-conducted trials uh, from other countries, for example, Australia. So I, I think while we should remain, a, a, have a cautious, um, you know, criticality of these studies, um, that I think overall the, they're incredibly valuable, the data we're getting out of all these trials from Iran. Um, and this was surprisingly the silly mar and the milk thistle extract, uh, not at a, a really high dose, 140 milligrams a day, compared with doxycycline or the two together. And um, it was over two months, uh, re response was monitored monthly, and lesions were evaluated using two scales, GAGs and ASI. <clears throat> and for the GAGs index, the result was the same as doxycycline, uh, but in the ASI, the acne severity index, it, uh, the doxycycline was significantly superior. And although the combination of the two, the improvement was more favorable, it didn't achieve statistical significance. And that probably reflects on numbers. You've only got 20 in each group. So it seems like you can add milk thistle, for example, to doxycycline. And, and get beneficial results in acne. And uh, I was struck by the images. So you've got two patients there, you've got the back, face of one patient and you see before and after 
it's not gone, but it's a pretty substantial improvement from, from a herb they wouldn't have normally thought about. And interestingly, it is a herb that milk thistle that's traditionally noted to enhance bile production. And if you look at, uh, at the back of this patient, again, substantial improvement, although it's not gone. And these are both after two months. And then we have, um, especially in women with high androgens, high testosterone, the combination of licorice and white peony is used traditionally in both China and Japan for women with PCOS or just women with high androgens. And that combination uh, has been shown to be effective in lowering testosterone, but also as per uh, this trial, um, equivalent six grams a day of both the peony root and the licorice root for 12 weeks, uh, as well as lowering uh, free testosterone compared to baseline uh, values in women with acne uh, also significantly reduce the number of le acne lesions. So that's it for our published data um, uh, for internal use of herbs. If we now look at the uh, topical use of herbs, we can see that uh, the best evidence is for tea tree oil. Now be careful about tea tree oil uh, because it's now widely adulterated. Um, they actually uh, make a synthetic type of tea tree oil and it's only when you use a very sophisticated gas chromatography that can differentiate between optical isomers of some of the terpenoids that you can tell the difference. So use a trusted source of tea tree oil and, and as a top, topical, you can see the results are very good, very good. I mean, here it was quite effective, not quite as effective as benzoyl peroxide. Um, uh, here, here compared to an erythromycin gel, it was probably slightly more effective, uh, definitely effective uh, a, against placebo and other good evidence. So, so we do have good evidence and that's, uh, these studies are, are done by Kate Hammer. Uh, she's, she did the review and she's also been involved in many of the studies and, and she's a microbiologist and clinician uh, who, who when I last met her was at the University of Western Australia here, here in Australia. She also, uh, there's another small open label trial of a tea tree gel uh, that, that she's published on as well, which, which gave a positive result. We also, of course, can draw on traditional Western herbs and acne. And, and here, uh, I'd like to review some of them from uh, particularly the United States uh, clinical texts because they're uh, you know, written by the eclectics in, in particular because they're, they're incredibly valuable. So golden seal and calendula, and we're talking internal use of calendula, and you see from King's uh, American Dispensatory around about 1905, that, that, that uh, edition, um, it mentions about acne, and uh, especially when dependent upon gastric difficulties. Um, but golden seal is one of my go-tos, most certainly for acne, and it contains berberine. I'm going to talk about berberine soon. Uh, and then calendula, you note it used both locally and internally. And then of course, I rarely do a presentation without mentioning my favorite herb, echinacea, and it does feature, I believe, in acne. And, and the original uh, um, Western proponent of of echinacea was Dr. Meyer, that's who the eclectics learned from, and uh, he claimed success uh, for this remedy in acne and eczema. Then we have another source, interestingly, of berberine, which is the Oregon grape, and, and this is from Allingwood, uh, the American Materia Medica, and Allingwood said it has cured persistent acne uh, when no local treatment was used. So Oregon grape, and, and he waxes lyrical. Allingwood's great, is very descriptive. 
It contributes to the removal of pimples and roughness and promotes a clear complexion, soft, smooth, and naturally moist skin and sensitive young ladies. We could probably make a fortune selling it as a beauty from within treatment, perhaps. That's the latest buzz, beauty from within. And surprisingly, uh, Damiana, which is considered a male herb, and you might think raises testosterone, um, but it, Allingwood did use it in a severe case of acne with success, but I'm not so sure about Damiana. So now let's look at, with the knowledge we have, how we can apply functional herbal therapy for acne. So what are our goals for acne treatment applying uh, herbs with a functional approach? We want to support and balance key endocrine responses. We want to eliminate a persistent pathogen, in this case, or reduce uh, C. acnes. We want to optimize immune function. We want to deal with the inflammatory side. We want to address any metabolic imbalances like insulin resistance and so on. And again, look at the role of gut dysbiosis and inflammatory factors like LPS from the, the gut. And also, I've quoted my uh, Mediherb Seminar Introduction to Functional Phytotherapy, which I now call Functional Herbal Therapy. Um, but I have done a presentation on this topic uh, for full script. So, as mentioned earlier, uh, I've outlined the key functional herbal therapy goals, but we can, if you like, elaborate further and almost regard as a subset any identified targets that relate to those goals that come from biomedical studies. And mTOR C1 is, now as I mentioned, we can best target mTOR C1 by using an indirect approach via AMPK insert one, and I'll show you about that. Uh, the second group of biomedical targets is insulin, um, and insulin resistance, HOMA IR, insulin resistance, and insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. Then we have androgens, and coupled with targeting androgens is also in lowering 5-alpha reductase and improving sex hormone binding globulin. Um, this one's not so much herbal, is dietary glycemic index and gly glycemic load. However, if you combine, for example, a herb like gymnema, with a meal or even something rich in polyphenolics like green tea, it will change and lower the GI of whatever the meal is by its impact on various enzymes and so on that will slow down the absorption of sugar. So you can use herbs as a target to artificially manipulate the glycemic index of a meal. Immunity, and that certainly overlaps with, with the main uh, functional herbal therapy target I've just mentioned, and as does skin inflammation and microbiome and gut microbiome, for which, as I mentioned, there's emerging evidence. So let's elaborate on some of these factors. So this was a study that was done on New York City uh, adults with and without moderate severe acne. So you've got, uh, you've got no acne, you've got moderate and severe acne. <laughs> So let's look at insulin. And you can see no acne, insulin's three, uh, moderate to severe acne, it's five. So uh, quite significant link there to insulin. Sex hormone binding globulin, no acne, 67, moderate to, to severe acne, 31. So we want to lower insulin, we want to boost sex hormone binding globulin, as already described, and again, we look at insulin resistance. Again, uh, lower in the no acne, double in the high acne. Now, no difference between glucose, fasting blood glucose in both groups, but if we look at IGF-1, not as marked, but in no acne, it's lower. In the moderate severe acne, it's higher. Oops, sorry, back one, don't want to do that. Um, and, and there was no, uh, no difference for insulin-like growth factor binding protein three. So that's why I didn't highlight. Now I mentioned about targeting mTOR C1 and blocking its effects uh, indirectly. 
and you see it's done by enhancing sirtuin one or sirt one responses and AMPK. And you see there are three things that do it: calorie restriction and certainly uh, low carb diet, exercise, and what the scientists in this paper describe as polyphenols, because you know credible scientists can't uh, can't quite struggle with the term herb, <laughs> so they go for a more scientific sounding name like polyphenols. But what are the critical polyphenols, um, phytonutrients, even phytochemicals that do upregulate SIRT1 and AMPK and hence will indirectly lower mTOR C1? They are berberine, resveratrol and curcumin. And of course curcumin you, you're going to be looking at for the inflammatory side as well. So let's look at berberine. Um, this study was done in women with PCOS and uh, the berberine dose was quite high, 1500 milligrams a day, and it was compared with metformin. Um, and I, I don't tend to dose quite high uh, with berberine, but I, I use the milk thistle, which is good for acne, as, as a synergist because it, 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 in, it inhibits uh, 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 the factor that pumps out the berberine from from the gut wall and and therefore helps its absorption. Uh, if you look at uh, changes in insulin resistance, you see with the berberine it went down from 4.9 to 2.6 and similarly with the metformin it went down around the same. But the really interesting thing was sex hormone binding globulin went up substantially with the berberine, 33.7, 58.7. So we have this traditional link of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, um, golden seal and Oregon grape with acne and we see that the berberine that they both contain does have favorable effects on uh, our targets from biomedical studies. So let's summarize how we hit the biomedical targets and, and I've actually introduced <laughs> some more uh, uh, data about what herbs are doing here that I haven't had time to elaborate on, so forgive me. So the first thing was indirectly targeting mTOR C1 and we have the herb polygonum, also known as fallopia, as a source of resveratrol, the, the curcumin in a bioavailable form or the turmeric and then the phalodendron as a source of berberine. In terms of insulin resistance and, and uh, IGF-1 and so on, uh, again we have the phalodendron for the berberine and, and the herb gymnema. Now interestingly uh, in terms of androgens we have the impact of uh, chase tree, uh, we also have the phalodendron for example as a source of berberine because it increases sex hormone binding globulin. And there are some small trials that suggest that St. John's wort and green tea might inhibit 5-alpha reductase, so <clears throat> that's why I have them in there. Then if we look at uh, manipulating dietary glycemic index and hence glycemic load, I've already mentioned this concept of gin neem and green tea taken with meals. Um, in terms of uh, working on immunity, my two favourite herbs in acne for that are Echinacea root and Andrographis. And of course, managing uh, skin inflammation and, and uh, we have the curcumin. We, uh, in terms of skin microbiome, a, a lot of that depends on you, what you put on your skin and what you uh, wash with your skin. And then for uh, balancing out the gut microbiome, uh, I do have this bowel flora balance protocol, which is mentioned as a whole chapter in my latest book on functional herbal therapy. Uh, plus we have the traditional herbs, golden seal, Oregon grape, and echinacea root. And we also have the herbs for which there's a clinical data. Possibly, um, possibly uh, green tea, but certainly the uh, chase tree 
and the milk thistle slash psyllimarin. And then of course you have the topical treatments with um, tea tree oil. And there are some useful combinations that I use. I, I have a combina uh, this combination andrographis, echinacea root and holy basil. Now this second one is an example of a traditional depurative or alterative formulation. And, and it's got the Oregon grape in there. So we shouldn't discount that, um, the use of those traditional herbs uh, as, as well. And, and there are other useful combinations there that I might use. So let's now summarize. We have our clinically trialed herbs as mentioned, and also, yes, I should have mentioned, especially in women with PCOS, the, the white, or high testosterone, the white peony and licorice, the milk thistle, the chase tree, and possibly the green tea, although the doses used were very high. Then we have the traditional Western herbs. So they're the ones I all, all mentioned, but also there's, there's, um, there's uh, um, some uh, depurative or alterative herbs I've thrown in there as well. Nutritional supplements based on clinical data, and then the functional herbal therapy combined with the biomedical targets, which I summarise again on the next slide. Topical treatments, tea tree oil, also there was a tradition of poke root ointment. And licorice can be quite valuable topically. I generally use a face rinse diluted with water, licorice extract, high in glycerizin, diluted with water, because that is, uh, has saponins in it, it acts as a natural gentle detergent. Because one of the problems is if you use a harsh detergent to strip the sebum from the skin in acne, you'll get a rebound sebum production. So your natural soaps, as per the, the glycerizin that's found in licorice, especially when it's diluted with water as a face wash, can be a nice gentle way to strip out the sebum without getting the rebound effect. Um, and, and of course, the, the diet is summarised there, but we've already discussed that. And then uh, our functional herbal ther therapy uh, treatment goals and the herbs that deliver on that is summarised there. And our biomedical targets and the herbs that deliver on that is summarised there. So thank you very much. And we'll now go over for questions. Okay, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I know we had a few questions roll in and we have a few minutes left, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, so the first question is, would any of what you spoke about be related to keratosis polaris? A good question. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know, I'd have to, uh, it's not a condition I'm treated, so I'm not very familiar with it. So I think what you should do is have a look at the, known pathophysiology of that condition and see which of those factors apply and then then you know which herbs you can apply to address those factors. Awesome, thank you. Um, in one of the slides, the paleo diet is discussed indicating that it's helpful for acne. However, in a later slide, a lower meat intake is recommended. The paleo yeah. diet tends to have a higher meat intake. Can you please ex explain this a little bit further? Uh, well, I'm talking about a traditional paleo diet, so not necessarily what's marketed as a modern paleo diet. And if you look at people living marginally, uh, having still, you know, like uh, traditional peoples in Africa and, and even, uh, to, well, until fairly recently, some traditional uh, people in Australia, um, meat's not a huge part of their diet. They do have it, but it's not a huge part of their diet. Uh, they obviously get it when they have it when they have a kill, uh, but that doesn't necessarily happen all the time. And a large part of their diet is, is well, certainly if we look at the uh, Australian Aborigines, a uh, large part of their traditional diet was, was about, uh, you know, what they call bush tucker, which was plant-based, you know, and they go foraging and that for various plants. Awesome, thank you. And um, our next question is, have they done any studies on the Mediterranean with acne as these diets include high healthy fats and dairy products? I'm curious about how their acne compares. Uh, they probably have, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, but I, I think as I showed you, the data is fairly robust. So certainly a Mediterranean diet would be good 
although I do have this question mark about olive oil. I, I probably ingested olive oil is not an issue, but there is the role of oleic acid, as you see in the pathophysiology. Um, that's the first aspect. And then the, the, the evidence linking dairy is, is quite robust and the biological plausibility by the mechanisms I showed you and the fact that dairy contains you know, growth factors, for example, that are not necessarily destroyed by processing. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest that if you wanted to apply a Mediterranean diet that you, you can optimize it, even if the Mediterranean diet does show some benefit, which no doubt it will because of the other reasons that it's good. Um, even if it shows a benefit, you could probably optimize that benefit further by, by reducing the dairy. I mean, you don't have to cold turkey it and go zero, but, but certainly uh, look at reducing it. Because the, certainly from the meta-analyses, you know, the, the, the odds ratio or risk factor is, is around 1.3. So, and that's generally what they do is they compare the highest intake versus the lowest intake. So you can lower, you know, the driver by 30%, but, but if you say had some modest dairy intake, well, you're still going to get a beneficial effect, um, maybe 25%, 20%. So it doesn't have to be zero dairy, but it should be limited. Thank you. The next question is, do you recommend using ginger as a topical treatment? Uh, well, I've certainly not seen any evidence for it, and and the ginger because of uh, you know it, it, the the factors in in ginger like like the ginger oils and sugar oils and particularly the sugar oils, uh, while they are anti-inflammatory, they they they're also on contact could you know because they're hot uh, could have some pro-inflammatory effects. So I. To be honest, I'd be fairly cautious about applying ginger topically in acne, and I've not seen any studies in that regard. Next question is, what is the dilution ratio for topical licorice? Okay, yeah, yeah, a simple practical question. Uh, so generally, generally about one in 10 to 20 with water. Perfect. And then which herb is best for cystic acne specifically? Oh, that's interesting. I would, I guess I showed my my bias, but I would particularly emphasise echinacea, and I particularly emphasise the immune side. So maybe even other immune herbs. And as I said, my, one of my other favourites is is andrographis. So more 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 the immune herbs. Awesome. And then we have time for one final question. So would the inclusion of lymph moving herbs used in combination with your protocols be relevant, especially in moving out cellular debris? Sorry, the inclusion of what herbs? Uh, lymph moving herbs. Lymph moving herbs. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so you've got this, these herbs that are assigned as lymphatic. Now it's quite an interesting topic because uh, there were some German researchers who looked at uh, the effect of a range of uh, herbs that were regarded as lymphatics on on lymph moving, and uh, and they showed that a lot of these ones they didn't actually have any effect on lymph. So I think what's happened is we've got uh, to some extent a misinterpretation over time of this concept of a lymphatic herb. And, and lymphatic herbs are often, you know, part and parcel of, of depurative or alterative herbs. So, for example, if we look at cleavers versus uh, it, it's both lymphatic and, and depurative. Um, I think a lot of the, and echinacea is described as a lymphatic herb. I think a lot of this comes more from the lymph nodes. So, in fact, we have two functions with lymph. We have these kind of guardian fortresses, which are the lymph glands or lymph nodes. Uh, which are more immunological, and then we have the lymph tissue and the flow itself, which is more circulatory. So, so um, I think they're being confused. So I think a lot of so-called lymphatic herbs don't move lymph at all. They work on immunity, and echinacea is the best example of that. And they're going to be valuable because, but because they work on immunity. Now, if you want to improve lymph flow, well, there is the herb called sweet clover that 
and there's a monograph of that in Principles and Practice of Phytotherapy. Um, there is a herb called sweet clover that does have a genuine uh, effect on lymph flow. But I tend to go with a, a perhaps a more modern functional herbal therapy approach when I want to improve microcirculatory flow as a whole. And there's a whole chapter in my book and I have a dietary protocol on boosting microcirculation. So yeah, if you want to help clear toxins out and what have you, I go now, I'd modernize it and go more for a microvascular, microcirculatory flow approach, which is fully described. And I recently did three hours of presentation on it. So, so but it's there in the book. Awesome, thank you. So I think that wraps up our question. Um, we know that everybody's time is super valuable. So we'll wrap up the presentation again by thanking you for being here, Professor Perrybone. We truly appreciate all of the attendees taking time out of their day to join us. And then just one more quick reminder that everyone will receive a copy of this recording as well as the slide deck from the presentation. And then again, you can also find all of our webinars on fullscript.com slash webinars. So thank you everyone again for being here and we hope to see you next time. And thank you. And I hope you've got some value out of this presentation. Have a great night.